one more time. Bruce Friedman, have you joined us? And if so, if you could send a private chat to one of the two um, hosts that are located under WTI staff members, just so we can make sure we have the correct phone number for you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today for pedestrian treatments for uncontrolled locations, the Safety Center's uh, January webinar. My name is Jamie Sullivan and I am the Safety Center Manager. Um, we are going to get started now and we are going to close out all these polls that are going around the outside of our screen currently. It looks like uh, the majority of you are viewing today's webinar by yourself, but we do have several of you in a group. As always, we would ask at the um, completion of today's webinar, if you have not all registered individually, if you could please send us an email to info, I-N-F-O, at ruralsafetycenter.org, and provide us with names and email addresses for all of those of you who are joining in the groups. Uh, this allows us to send you our surveys, um, and our survey is the only way that you can request uh, both PDHs and certificates of completion for today's uh, webinar. We also look like we have a very good um, mix of people joining us today. We have about 32% from local DOT, 23% from state DOT, about 4% um, from our federal partners, and then we have um, about 20% of private consultants today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we have most of you are joining us by computer only, um, and a few of you via the phone as well. So I will remind you that um, in case you do have any audio issues with today's webinar, we would ask those of you listening via computer only to please call in. That 800 number is located in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Um, sometimes the, the internet does um, prove a little tricky during these webinars, and if that is the case, we would ask you to call in. And then where is everyone joining us from today? It looks like um, we have about 50% of you from the Midwest today, 20% from the Western US, 18% um, from the Northeast, and about 9% from the Southeast. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, I am going to move us over to the presentation at this point. And just one more reminder to um, all of our presenters and all of our FHWA folks that we do have unmuted currently, I'm just going to uh, remind you to please make sure that you have your phone lines muted yourself uh, during our presentation today. A few logistics to go over with everyone. As always, our webinar will be an hour and a half long. It is being recorded and will be archived on our website and should be there in about a week. Um, for quality of this recording, as we've mentioned, all phone lines have been muted with exception of a few people who will be presenting and answering questions for us today. Uh, if you are listening on the phone, we would ask that you please mute your computer, otherwise you will hear some feedback. 
To maximize your presentation, um, there are a few tables that will be shown in today's presentation that may look a little small. So if you would like to maximize the size, um, there are four arrows that point outward in the top right-hand corner of your screen. That will make the PowerPoint itself full screen so that you will be able to see that a little bit better. At the end of each section today, there will be time for question and answers. Um, you can give those questions via the chat pod, which is on the left-hand side of your screen currently. Um, you can type those questions in at any time, and when we do stop for a question and answer period, I will read those out to our presenters. There's also a handout pod in the bottom left-hand corner, um, and that does have a PDF version of today's presentation, which includes the, um, the link to download the resource that we will be talking about as well. And as always, if you wouldn't mind completing our follow-up surveys, we would um, appreciate that. There will be one that comes out directly following today's webinar. As I mentioned, this is the one that you can request certificates of completion and PDHs from. There will also be another one that comes out in about three months to see how you have used this information, whether or not you have um, passed this information along to a colleague, if you have put into practice any of the information you learned and those types of things. The one in three months is only about three questions long, so it's fairly short. Today's presenters, we have Yan Chi, who is an assistant professor with the Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville. Prior to coming to Southern Illinois University, she was an engineering faculty member with Montana Tech. She currently is conducting research on pedestrian safety, distracted driver behavior, rural highway safety, snowplow routing optimization, and snowplow operators training. Yan earned her PhD in civil engineering and an MS in applied statistics, both from Louisiana State University. She's also a licensed professional engineer registered in Louisiana. And we also have Kyle Armstrong uh, joining us today. He is the Acting Engineer of Traffic, Traffic Operations in Illinois DOT's Central Bureau of Operations. He is a graduate of the University of Illinois, where he received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. He has worked at the Illinois DOT for 18 years, mostly for District 6 office in Springfield, as a traffic signal engineer and traffic operations engineer. His duties as the Acting Engineer of Traffic Operations include developing policies, procedures, and programs for the installation and maintenance of traffic control devices, including signing and pavement markings. Kyle is also responsible for reviewing traffic regulations to ensure the safe, economical, and efficient operations of the highway transportation system in Illinois. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Illinois and is a certified professional traffic operations engineer through ITE. And we are very thankful to have both of them with us today. The goals for the webinar, once you've completed the webinar today, you'll be able to implement pedestrian treatments appropriately at uncontrolled locations in rural and local settings for improved pedestrian safety. And today's presentation has been broken into five learning objectives for you. The first is to understand the characteristics of pedestrian safety in rural and local areas. The second is to identify appropriate locations for uncontrolled pedestrian crossings. The third is to use the guidelines to select appropriate pedestrian treatments at uncontrolled locations. The fourth, evaluate the effectiveness of existing pedestrian treatments at uncontrolled locations. And the last one will be to list other non-treatment factors that affect pedestrian safety at uncontrolled locations. So as you can see, there will be five uh, sections where we stop for question and answers today. And at this point, I am going to turn the presentation over to Yan to begin. Yan? Uh, hello. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here today to uh, present our most recent research results on the pedestrian safety. It is a guideline for pedestrian treatment at uncontrolled locations. Uh, first of all, I want to point out this guideline uh, was developed uh, based on extensive review of literature from past studies, existing uh, guidelines, procedures from local, state, and uh, national level, as well as the interview survey of like uh, Illinois engineer, uh, state and local. Of course. And also we do some um, crash analysis and uh, high crash corridor fuel review. And of course, 
uh, we also use some engineer judgment uh, in this procedure too. Uh, for these uh, guidelines, the overall goal is to improve pedestrian safety uh, in general, but still we are more focused on uh, severity uh, injuries and fatalities. Uh, since this webinar is uh, it's facing uh, mainly for audience from rural uh, area. So uh, the first, uh, I want to talk about uh, the characteristics of pedestrian safety in a rural and local area. At the very beginning, I want to uh, first present some crash data. Uh, this is based on the pedestrian crash data at uncontrolled locations in Illinois from 2010 to 2014. And we break down into urban, rural area, and also into three uh, severity categories. Uh, I want you to uh, pay attention to the, the last column uh, for the severity injury and the blast fatality. You can see the percentage for severity injury and fatalities for rural area is almost double uh, of the urban area. That means if the pedestrian is involved in the crash, the chance of this pedestrian is severely injured and killed is much, much higher in the rural area than in the urban area. So the question will be, why is that? Why is it like this? So it's all related to the settings and the highway geometries and the operation and traffic characteristics in the rural area. So first, with open surroundings and less traffic and the wide laneways, the motorists are more likely to be speeding. And usually the rural area have a higher speed limits than the urban area. So this high speed uh, usually decreases motorist yielding rates and increase the chance of severe crashes when it happens. And next, with this wide laneways and uh, multiple lanes and absence of the raised medium, this all increase the pedestrian exposure to the live traffic. And also with low pedestrian volume, the motorists don't, really don't expect pedestrians to cross the street in rural area as much as in urban area. This is a very important point like we uh, observed uh, or, or learned from this study. Uh, most uh, severe and uh, fatality uh, cases occurred when the motorists didn't expect uh, there will be pedestrian to crossing. And also we have uh, some key findings beyond those uh, uh, characteristics uh, related to rural area. So large number of severe crashes occurred at non-designated pedestrian crossing locations. For example, there will be pedestrian come from between the parking vehicles along the roadside and get injured and killed. So those cases indicate that either there are pedestrian crossing need over there, but, but that no marked pedestrian crossing are provided to meet this need, or those locations are not really suitable for uncontrolled pedestrian crossing. But still there's some need, so the agency still need to do something to, to fit this need. Uh, we, we will talk to, uh, it, uh, about it later on, uh, later. And uh, other key findings is high percentage of severe crashes occurred during dark conditions. Uh, we all know like poor lighting conditions result in poor visibility. For these dark conditions, we observe like mainly two cases. One is there's no light unit at all, no lighting at all. The other case it will be there's a light, light unit, but it's not enough. It's not adequate to provide enough visibility. So that's the two cases involves high uh, percentage of uh, severe crashes. Uh, I believe that's all for the first section, and then we'll come to the question part. I will turn it back to Jamie. Jamie? Perfect. Thank you very much. And so we do have a question for you, our audience, at this point. I'm going to move over to that one. The question is, what are the possible reasons that higher percentage of severe crashes was found in rural areas than urban areas? Is it motorists are more likely to, to be speeding with open surroundings, wide lane width, and multiple lanes? 
Wide lane width and multiple lanes increase pedestrian exposure to live traffic. High speed limits decrease yielding rates and increase the chance of severe crashes. With less pedestrian volume, motorists don't expect pedestrian volume. Motorists don't expect pedestrians to cross the street as much as in urban areas. All of the above, none of the above, or I don't know and I don't remember. We'll just go ahead and give you a, a second to fill that out. Um, at this point, we are open for questions. If anyone has any, they can feel free to put those into the um, chat pod on the left-hand side. And I will remember, remind everyone once again who have their phone lines open to please go ahead and mute those. We do have some, some feedback of uh, computer typing going on in the background. So it looks like everyone has um, answered our poll question, and I have now broadcast those results for you, Yen. Oh, yeah. I saw a um, majority, almost 90% of our participants all answer all of above. That's, that's correct. Uh, actually, all of them about um, the most rest are more likely to be speeding. Um, multiple lengthways increased exposure and high speed uh, increased the yielding rate, uh, increased the chance of severe crashes and decreased the yielding rate. And with less pedestrian volume, motorists uh, don't expect pedestrians to cross much as much as in urban area. So that's all related to the uh, like rural like setting. I think uh, you all, most of you answered the uh, question right. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. I am going to move us back over to our presentation so we can continue on. There have been no questions in the chat pod as of yet. OK, great. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. And then we will go to go get into the main topic for today. It's the guidelines for pedestrian treatment at uncontrolled locations. To do the that treatment, the first question we want to ask will be, where will be the appropriate location for uncontrolled pedestrian crossing? So this is uh, the focus for this uh, section number two. First, uh, I want to get a clear definition for the what's the uncontrolled location here. Here we define the uncontrolled location as mid-block locations and intersection approaches without traffic signals or stop or yield sign. So. That means uncontrolled mid-block locations and minor roads with, with two-way stop sign control intersections. And all the four approaches of the uncontrolled intersections are considered as uncontrolled locations in our study. And then given this definition, what will be the proper location for us to get a marked crosswalk there? So for easy use, we uh, summarize those into yes conditions and no conditions for a marked crosswalk at uncontrolled locations. So first, the yes situation. We have a two uh, yes situation. The first one is about the crosswalk usage. Uh, and within this crosswalk usage, we have uh, two items. One is a request from the local governor or community. So we do have the, the need for the, from local um, government or community. The second one will be this location is along the walk, walking path towards identified pedestrian generator or destinations, such as the park. Okay. Uh, those are the two uh, crosswalk usage yes situation. Someone uh, may ask, uh, why don't you have a pedestrian volume requirement? Uh, actually, we consider that. Uh, for, for some of the existing guidelines we reviewed, they do have a required minimum pedestrian volume during the peak hour, for example, 20 pedestrians per hour. Uh, but we decide not to use this uh, pedestrian volume minimum like a threshold. The reason that based on our credit analysis and the fuel review, often cases the severity and the fatality occurred where the pedestrian volume is very low. 
So that means even there's not many crossing crossing there, but still it could happen with like a very severe and fatality injury. But still we as a agency still have to do something to improve the safety over there and to provide some treatment over there. So that's why we do not have a, a specific number of the pedestrian volume as a requirement for a yes situation. But we only see, okay, if that request from the local community or if this location along the path towards some pedestrian gener generator or destination, that would be okay to consider to have a marked crosswalk. So uh, that's the first crosswalk usage yes situation. The other one is about crash record. So we suggest if there are two B or A injury crashes in the last two years, or if there's a one fatality, so that will trigger a study to, to consider to have a marked crosswalk over there. Um, this is a, we all well know this is a reactive, not a proactive way to do the uh, uh, treatment. But still, I think it's necessary, like other warrants in the MTCD. And for type A and type B injury, uh, it's, it's all follow the cable skills. Um, I think most states or uh, agencies use the cable skills, but uh, the definition of A and B or C is, is slight different. So I have the definition from A and B from Illinois DOT. So it's, it's there. Even they are different, but still I think it's a very slight difference. So that's the second uh, yes situation. Uh, so next, we talk about no situation for the marked crosswalk. That means if if this location meets any of the no situation, that means they are out. They will not recommend any uncontrolled crossing over there. So the first no situation will be controlled by uh, speed limits. Here, we suggest if the speed limit is above 40 miles per hour, we do not suggest any uncontrolled uh, pedestrian crossing. Because past studies have shown uh, that if the impact speed is above 40 miles per hour, the probability for the pedestrian to get killed is over like 80 percent, it's very high. So we just uh, have this uh, threshold, okay, 40 miles above not uh, su suggested for uncontrolled pedestrian crossing. So that's the first one. A second one is the traffic volume uh, control, uh, no situation. So we kept the traffic volume at ADT is 35,000 vehicles per day. So if, if the ADT is beyond this threshold, this, will, this, this road will be too busy. Uh, the pedestrian can hardly find any gap to go through. So we don't really consider this is safe for them to cross. So here, we, we kept them at 35,000. <clears> so some, some, uh, some people may ask, why is 35,000? Why not, why not is 30,000? So here, um, there's some, uh, something I want to share will be this number, 35,000 vehicle per, per day, how we get then this number? So we have to do like two, um, two kind of a, uh, like procedure. First, we have all the fatalities within last five years uh, data collected and check what's the, what's the uh, daily traffic ADT for that location for the fatalities. And the highest is around this 35,000. And also, we ask around within this uh, project panel uh, consists of the engineers from all over the Illinois state and the local government and ask their inputs. So what do you think will be the, the cap traffic volume for pedestrian uh, crossing? And this is uh, the number we come up with, uh, finally, 35,000 vehicles per day. And you may notice this is a much higher uh, number compared to some other existing guidelines. For example, Cedro have a publication in 2000, 2005 or 2006. The cap is at, at 15,000. That's much, much lower than our number. Uh, first, we didn't use that 15,000 because this study is like a ten, over 10 years ago. It's a way back. And over 10 years, 
we have some new technology developed, and we have a new treatment uh, countermeasures, uh, and they all proved effective even at a much higher traffic volume beyond 15,000. So this is why, um, based on our study and based on the inputs from our local engineer, so we kept this traffic volume at 35,000 vehicles per day. So that's the second no situation uh, condition. The third one is crossing distance. Um, so here I have two conditions, two categories. One is undivided road. The other one is divided road. So for undivided road, if it's beyond two lanes, we don't, con don't suggest to have uncontrolled pedestrian crossing. So for divided roadways, if it's beyond three lanes in two directions, we do not recommend any uh, uncontrolled pedestrian crossing. Um, of course, all, all this, like four lanes and six lanes, is all based, again, the crash data analysis and the field review. Uh, most cases we observed, uh, the fatalities and the severe crashes occurred when there's like more than like four lanes or even five, six lanes for undivided or divided roadways. So that's why we have this constraint here. Uh, and also I want to point out uh, how we define the undivided and the divided roadway. We only consider the road is divided when the road has raised the median. Okay. If, if it's only painted medium, so they are not considered as divided roadway. So only the raised medium to separate the two directions, so we can consider as divided roadway. So that's the third no situation. Uh, also, we have a two more no situation. Uh, one is cross, crosswalk spacing. Uh, here we uh, define like uh, if there's alternative crossing location within 300 feet in the rural or local setting, well, we do not recommend any other crossing within this, this area because we don't want to get too many crosswalk to increase the exposure of the pedestrian to live traffic. And this 300 feet can be relaxed to 200 feet for the urban setting like Chicago area. So they can do more dense uh, crosswalk. Another constraint will be the crosswalk should be beyond 100 feet away from the driveway to uh, increase the safety of the pedestrian. So that's the crosswalk spacing requirement. The last one will be the side distance. Uh, so for any locations that not have inadequate stop side distance or pedestrian side distance, we do not recommend any crossing like the crosswalk. So this is the obvious. So if this side distance is inadequate, the pedestrians cannot see the motorist, and the motorist cannot see the pedestrians. So that's really the very like a dangerous situation. And I believe that's the yeah that's the uh, all for the second uh, section. So that comes to our question time. I will turn back to Demi, please. Thank you, Yan. Um, we will take questions now in the chat pod on the left-hand side if anyone has them. And we are going to move again over to a poll break. That chat pod is still there. I'm just waiting for it to catch up with us. Um, so we have an example here that Ian has provided. And the question is, is it appropriate to have a crosswalk through Jefferson Street, yes or no, based on the information uh, provided in the table? And again, if you are needing to look at it bigger, there are the four arrows that point outwards um, in the top right of that slide that you can look at it full screen. Give everyone just another second. Um, we do have one more example that we would like your answers on after this one as well.
Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and close that and broadcast the results for you so you can address this one. Ian, are you still with us? Oh, sorry, I okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay, no I, problem. Uh, uh, I saw this result, and I see uh, eight, over eighty percent of the audience choose yes. So that's our correct correct answer. And uh, look at this example. This is a site we reviewed in Peoria, Illinois, uh, and the the Southwest Jefferson Street. It's a the T intersection with the Harrison uh, Street, and uh, this the Har the south the southwest Jefferson Street is uncontrolled, so we have no marked crosswalk, okay, over there. But we only have uh, right now we only have a, a standard pattern the marked crosswalk along this Harrison Street, but we do have a one A injury and a C injury a two C injury within the last five years, and uh, you see this area. It's so have so many pedestrian like destinations. So there's a bus hub and a civic center, and uh, uh, the traffic speed is 30 miles per hour, and uh, lighting and side distance is all adequate, and the alternative crosswalk is beyond the 300 feet away, and the number of lanes is a uh, undivided street lanes, so uh, traffic volume is low, much lower than 35,000. So we think it is a uh, is a place we suggest to have a, a marked crosswalk along this uh, southwest Jefferson Street. I think most of the audience get this right. Thanks. And I believe there's another uh, question in this section. Yep. I'm going to move everyone over to that one right now as well. And so this is one more example. Um, is it appropriate to have a crosswalk through Illinois Route 29 at Taft Drive? And again, there is a, a picture and a table available here, and you can make that full screen again by point, uh, pressing on those four outward arrows. We'll give everyone just a couple minutes. While we are doing this, I will mention the, the next two sections, we will not have um, poll questions for you. So if you do have any questions for our speakers uh, as they're talking through the next two sections, you can go ahead and put those in the chat pod at any time. OK, and yeah, it does look like everyone has answered at this point. So I'm going to broadca broadcast the results for you. Great, great. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, uh, look at the result. 77% of the audience pick, select no, and 20, 20%, 22% select yes. So let's look at this example. So this is a like, rural road in Illinois, Road 29, uh, crossed with the Taft uh, Drive at the Rochester, Illinois. And we do have a fatality um, in the last two years. And the situation here will be it's a, it's a divided five lanes. That's one left turn lane over this intersection. And the speed limit is over, is over 40 miles. It's 45 miles per hour. So uh, even they have like a lane, lane width, number of lanes meets the requirement. But the speed limit is much, much higher than the threshold. So just to, we because of the speed limits, we cannot recommend uh, pedestrian crossing over here. But uh, since we do have a fatality over there, so I think the agencies still need to do something to address this issue. So what we can do, we for example, we can start a study to see if it's possible for this site to, to get a controlled pedestrian crossing. For example, the traffic light or pedestrian hybrid beacon, or to have a 
engineer study to see if it's possible to reduce the speed limit from 45 to 40 miles per hour. That will be uh, qualified this, this location to be an uncontrolled pedestrian crossing mark place. So that's the uh, kind of options um, the agents have uh, to, to address this uh, like a fatality issues. Uh, I think that will be uh, all for this section. And one more thing I forgot to mention. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> Can you go back to the slides? Yes. Uh, that's one more thing I want to uh, mention uh, before we uh, go to next session. We have the, the yes situation and the no situation. So how to use this yes and no situation? So as long as this location meet one yes situation and it does not meet any of the no situation, it will be uh, justify to consider to have a marked crosswalk. But if this location meets any one of the no situation, this location will be disqualified based on our recommendation. So that's how we use the yes and no. So any yes and no, no, no no's. So that's how we use that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, and I do also want to point out that typically we do not put the poll questions into the PDF version of the PowerPoint slides, but for this particular webinar, we have included those. So again, um, that handout is in the bottom left-hand corner, and that will provide you with both the question and the answer. Uh, if you'd like to look at those a little bit more closely, you can download those out of the handout section. And now I am going to turn the presentation over to Kyle, who is going to go through um, the third learning objective. And again, there will not be a poll break, but there will be a question break at the end of this section. Um, Kyle is going to go through several examples for us. Kyle? All right. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss some of our uh, research findings. Uh, I was one of the chairs for uh, this research project. And I plan on discussing the next uh, two sections, which will go over some of the uh, countermeasures that were studied and considered as part of this research. And we're also going to go over what I consider to be the primary deliverable from this research, and that is the recommendations table for which countermeasures to consider for different situations and different types of crosswalks. So we'll go ahead and get started. So this is basically a summary of the different countermeasures that were considered as part of the research. And the individual countermeasures were categorized into five different categories. There were basic treatments, which consists of the basic marked crosswalk along with standard pedestrian warning signs. Then there were enhanced treatments, which included advanced stop lines and the associated sign, in-street crossing signs, and overhead crossing signs. We also considered different geometric elements, such as curb extensions or bulb outs, road diets, raised medians, and raised crosswalks. Uh, we also have a category for warning beacons, which consist of a standard flashing beacons or flashing pedestrian crossing signs. And we also have a category for a control beacon, which is the pedestrian hybrid beacon, or sometimes referred to as a hawk. And we consider that to be a control beacon because that beacon actually controls the vehicular traffic and assigns right of way between vehicles and pedestrians. So let me go into a little bit more detail about each of these individual countermeasures. So as I said before, a basic treatment is essentially a marked crosswalk along with the use of standard MUTCD compliant pedestrian warning signs. And what you see on the slide now are standard warning assemblies for these pedestrian signs. So the assembly that you see on the far left of the slide is a standard pedestrian warning sign with a plaque that has a diagonal downward arrow. So this is the assembly that would be utilized at the crosswalk itself. 
The next assembly to the right is the same pedestrian warning sign, but then includes a supplemental plaque that can either display the word ahead or actually give the distance to the crosswalk. So this particular assembly would be placed in advance of the crosswalk to give the motorists some advance warning that they are actually approaching a pedestrian crosswalk. The assemblies on the right side of the slide would be utilized if you have a crosswalk that's within a school zone or is designated as a school uh, pedestrian crosswalk or as part of a designated school pathway. So if that was the case, you would want to utilize the standard S1-1 sign for the school pedestrian warning sign as opposed to the standard diamond-shaped pedestrian warning sign. So moving on to enhanced treatments. So these would be additional countermeasures that are installed along with the basic treatment of the marked crosswalk and the pedestrian warning signs. So the enhanced treatments can uh, include in-street pedestrian signs, which is what is shown on the far left of this slide. It's a sign that is actually mounted on a median or actually directly on the pavement, on the lane line or the center line. Uh, the next sign to the right is the overhead mounted pedestrian warning sign. And then the next two signs to the right are regulatory signs that are mounted in conjunction with an advanced stop line. So the picture you see to the right uh, shows it, an implementation of a basic treatment along with some of these enhanced treatments. So you'll see a marked crosswalk along with the standard pedestrian warning sign assembly, which is the basic treatment. And then you see the enhanced treatment of an advanced stop line with the sign as well as an overhead mounted warning sign. Now, a couple more things I want to point out about these signs. The, the signs you see on the slide show the stop symbol within them. The research we conducted was specific to Illinois, and Illinois statutes actually require motorists to stop for pedestrians in crosswalks. So if you are planning to use one of these enhanced treatments, you want to make sure that the sign that you utilize has the symbol that matches with whatever is required by your own particulars, by your own particular state statutes or local laws or ordinances. The MUTCD does allow a yield symbol to be utilized within these signs. So you want to make sure, again, that you're using the sign that matches with your local statutes. In addition, I also want to point out the placement of the advanced stop line, the MUTCD recommends 20 to 50 feet in advance of the crosswalk. As part of this research, we would actually recommend going to at least 40 feet from the crosswalk. And the reason why we recommend that is we want to make sure that we're providing adequate sight distance for the pedestrian as they are approaching the crosswalk. And that's particularly true for multi-lane approaches to the crosswalk. So again, having that 40 feet of distance from the advanced stop line to the crosswalk provides some adequate sight distance for the pedestrian as well as the motorist. Okay, moving on to geometric elements. Uh, this includes curb extensions or bulb outs, as you can see in the upper left corner of the slide. It also includes road diets, raised medians, split pedestrian crossovers, and raised crossings. So basically with these geometric elements, what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to reduce the length of the crosswalk, which thus reduces the exposure of the pedestrian to motorists. And we're also wanting to provide some safe refuge for pedestrians, particularly with the raised median. So that way we provide them a safe area to complete their crossing of the particular roadway. So these are another group of countermeasures that can be considered to improve safety at uncontrolled locations. 
Okay, the next category is warning beacons. So again, this includes the standard flashing beacon as well as uh, LED blinking signs. So these would be signs that actually have LED modules embedded within them that flash when activated. Uh, one recommendation from this research is that if you do install a standard flashing beacon, it is preferable to place that beacon on a programmed timer or actually have it be pedestrian actuated. And the reason for that is if you have the beacon only activated when a pedestrian is present, you are much more likely to get better compliance from the motorist to where they'll actually notice the pedestrian and actually yield or stop for the pedestrian. If you have the flashing beacon operating 24-7, the motorists who regularly use this roadway are going to have a tendency to eventually tune it out, especially if pedestrians typically aren't present at the location. So again, if you have that on a timer or you have that actually be pedestrian actuated, you're increasing the chances of motorist compliance. One thing I do want to mention since we're on the topic of warning beacons, there is a device called the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon. It's a device that's not in the MUTCD, but it did receive interim approval from the Federal Highway Administration. When we were conducting this research, this Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon still had interim approval and was an allowable device. So we included it in the research. Uh, after the final report was issued and before this presentation, the interim approval for that device was terminated by the Federal Highway Administration. So I just want to point out and make it clear that if anyone reviews the final report for this research, you will see references to the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, and you will also see the RRFB located in the recommendations table of the research. I just want to clarify that that device is no longer an approved device for new installations. And then finally, there's the pedestrian hybrid beacon, or HAWK. So again, this is a device that is assigning right-of-way between vehicles and pedestrians. So essentially, a uh, pedestrian actuates this beacon Whenever they receive a standard walk indication, then the hybrid beacon goes or displays a red indication for motorists and requires them to stop. And then whenever pedestrian receives the flashing don't walk indication, then the beacon displays a flashing wig-wag red indication, which tells the motorist that they are allowed to proceed through the crosswalk as long as they yield to any pedestrians that are actually still within the crosswalk. I do want to briefly mention in-roadway warning lights. Uh, this particular countermeasure was not included as part of the research we conducted, but it is an allowable treatment that can be considered for crosswalks. Uh, it essentially consists of LED units that are embedded in the pavement itself. And whenever a pedestrian actuates uh, the warning lights, the warning lights will actually flash and provide a warning indication to motorists that there is a pedestrian present in the crosswalk. And as I see this slide, I should point out that the crosswalk in this slide is actually painted yellow. Any crosswalk markings you use do need to be white in compliance with the MUTCD, so I, I do want to clarify that. Um, one other point I do want to make about in-roadway warning lights is there can be some maintenance issues with them, particularly with roadways that have high traffic volumes. Uh, so that's one thing you may want to consider if you are actually looking at implementing in-roadway warning lights. But I just wanted to clarify that even though this particular treatment was not included as part of our research, it is still a viable countermeasure that can be considered for pedestrian crosswalk safety. Okay, so now that we've gone over some of the different countermeasures, I want to talk about the actual 
recommendations table that was developed as part of this research. I know there's a lot of information displayed on this chart, so I want to go over and kind of summarize the format of the chart itself. Basically, this table is providing the, me the minimum recommendations for a crosswalk depending on the traffic volumes, the posted speed, the number of lanes, and the presence of a raised median. And we're going to go over several examples of how to use this chart. I should point out on this chart there are several abbreviations. So this next slide goes over exactly what those abbreviations are. So in the table, BT would stand for basic treatment, which again is your marked crosswalk with the warning signs. Uh, ASLS would be advanced stop line and sign, so that again is one of your enhanced treatments. FB is a standard flashing beacon. And FS is a flashing pedestrian crossing sign where you've got the LED modules actually within the sign. And then PHB is a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Uh, there are also notes included with this table. Um, one of the notes and another one of the recommendations is that lighting is recommended, uh, especially for mid-block crosswalks. So that's another thing to consider in addition to the actual treatments that are classified as traffic control devices. I've also seen a few questions in the chat pod regarding lanes and what's actually considered a lane. For purposes of this table, the lanes not only include the through lanes, but also the turn lanes and any bi-directional turn lanes as well. So we'll go over some examples that include both through lanes and turn lanes. So our first example was the first example that Jan had uh, mentioned in Peoria regarding whether or not a crosswalk should be used. So let's say we've determined that crosswalks should be used at this location. What type of treatments would be recommended? So based on the ADT at this location, which was 9,200 vehicles per day, the speed limit of 30 miles per hour and the number of lanes, which was three lanes, one way. If we take a look at the chart, the ADT falls within this 9,000 to 15,000 range. And we take a look at the road that has three lanes without a raised median. And we look at the column that has 30 miles per hour, you'll see that the recommendation is BT which is basic treatment. So based on the ADT and the speed and the number of lanes, the recommendation would be to use the March crosswalk along with the standard pedestrian warning signs. Now again, I want to point out the recommendations in this table are just the minimum recommendations. You can certainly go beyond the minimum and use additional devices such as beacons or the advanced stop line with sign. You don't have to just go strictly with what the minimum recommendations are. So that's an example of using the table in an urban setting. The next example is the rural setting where we had determined that a pedestrian crossing should not be used due to the 45 mile per hour speed. Let's say for purposes of using this chart that the speed limit was actually 40 miles per hour. So the ADT at this particular location was, is 13,000 vehicles per day. Let's say the traffic speed was 40 miles per hour. And this particular roadway is divided four lanes with a turn lane. So the actual number of lanes that we would use for purposes of this table would be five. So if we take a look at the chart, we go to the ADT range of 9,000 to 15,000. We use the column for 40 miles per hour, and we use the row that says five or six lanes with raised median. The recommendation would actually be a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Now let's go over a few other scenarios for this particular location. 
let's say that we did not have a raised median at this location. So if you look at the row that says four, five, or six lanes without a raised median, we have text here, and it says, consider pedestrian refuge, island, or road diet. So that's how we incorporate some of the geometric uh, improvement examples that we had discussed previously. If there is a raised median or a road diet is feasible, then follow the recommendations from the above lane configuration. So that would be the row that says five or six lanes with a raised median. Otherwise, if a road diet or other geometric elements are not feasible, then we recommend using the row that's below for a four lane without raised median to decide what the pedestrian crossing treatment should be. So if this particular location did not have a raised median, we would go to the row that states four lanes, raised median not feasible. That would be the very bottom row. And again, the recommendation would be a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Now, the actual location actually had a speed of 45 miles per hour. And has, as Jan had mentioned previously, as part of this research, we're not recommending uncontrolled crosswalks whenever you have a posted speed of 45 miles per hour or more. So what would we do in that situation if it's actually 45 miles per hour? Well, as Jan had mentioned, we would recommend performing a more involved traffic study, perhaps a traffic signal warrant study to determine if traffic signals should actually be used at this intersection. And that can account for pedestrian volumes as well as the actual vehicular volumes at the intersection. OK, Jamie, I believe that's the end of this section. Should I just move on to the next section? Um, no, I'm actually going to have you stop. We have quite a few questions in the chat pod, so I'm going to start reading those out to you one at a time. OK. okay? The very first one we have is that crash locations and severity often fluctuate considerably from year to year. How do you account for this in determining where to establish marked crosswalks? I'll provide some input for that uh, question. In Illinois, when we're determining whether a location or a segment is considered high crash, we will typically look at the average of the last three years or perhaps even five years of data. So when you're looking at multiple years of data, you're essentially accounting for those fluctuations in the number and severity of crashes. We also have other statistical factors that we take a look at to determine what we would consider to be a high crash location or a high crash segment. So I think when you're looking at previous crash data, you'll definitely want to look at multiple years, at least three years and preferably five years to help account for those fluctuations. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we also had a question about whether or not the PowerPoint would be available after the presentation. Um, a PDF version of this presentation is available currently in the handout section in the bottom left um, side of your screen. It will also be available again on our website with the um, archived version of this uh, streaming webinar. Um, the next question we have. Um, you already answered about the lanes being defined as travel lanes, but you did mention that that also included the turn lanes. Do you have anything else you'd like to mention about that, Kyle? I'll just clarify again that the far left column of the recommendations table, when it's referring to the number of lanes, again, that not only includes the through lanes, but also includes any bidirectional turn lanes or any actual turn lanes at the location. Um, and a follow-up question on that as well. What is meant by pedestrian sight distance? Pedestrian sight distance is you're basically wanting to make sure that the pedestrian has enough visibility to see any vehicles that may be approaching the crosswalk. And this is particularly an issue for multi-lane highways. Um, there may be situations where 
you, if you have a vehicle that stopped right at the crosswalk and there's an adjacent through lane for the same direction, your essentially the vehicle that's in that one lane is obscuring the visibility of the pedestrian of any other vehicles that may be coming in the adjacent through lane. So again, by having that stop line further back from the crosswalk, you're having vehicles stop further away from the crosswalk itself, and you're giving pedestrians better visibility to any other vehicles that may be approaching the crosswalk from adjacent through lanes. Um, the next question that we have for you as well, how do the yes and no factors that you went over compare with the warrants in the MUTCD for marked crosswalks? Jan, you might want to provide some input on this, but I believe when we were considering the yes or no uh, factors, we were considering the recommendations and guidelines that are in the MUTCD, correct? Jan, are you still there? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, yes, I agree with Kyle. Uh, when you look at MTCD, there are no specific like numbers like for the conditions with like uh, crosswalk or no crosswalk. And uh, when we develop these um, guidelines, we uh, try to do something that is suitable, uh, fit for our like uh, condition, but also we com com a lot of comply with the MTCD. So that's that's what we did. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, is an ADA-compliant receiving pad mandatory to mark a crosswalk? I, I would have to check ADA and PROWAG recommendations on that, and it may also depend from state to state or agency to agency. I don't believe it's absolutely mandatory to have one if you're establishing a crosswalk, uh, but that's something I would need to double check on. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what if prevailing speeds do not recommend a lower speed limit? You know, in one of your examples, um, you had said that the crosswalk would not be warranted if it was at the 45 mile per hour, but if you looked at it at a lower speed, it may be. Right. I, I believe Jan had mentioned that particular example where the speed limit was 45 miles per hour, and she had mentioned performing an engineering study to uh, reduce the speed limit. Let's say you go out and you actually perform that study, and the prevailing speeds or the 85th percentile actually indicate that it should remain at 45. That is the case where I would recommend studying uh, the need for actual traffic signals, actually performing a signal warrant study at that point. Um, if signals aren't warranted, uh, you might want to actually consider looking at a grade separated crossing or pedestrian bridge. And I do realize that is a considerable expense for agencies. Um, but it, it's something to at least look at and consider for uh, future construction and development. Thank you. And we did also have someone put in the chat pod an answer to the ADA question. Um, and they did say ADA detectable warning mats surfaces are required where a walking surface meets a roadway. So there's a um, little bit more on that. Uh, we asked, someone else asked if we can update on the FH, latest FHWA ruling on RRFBs, um, and I do think that Kyle provided that answer already. There will be one slide at the very end of our presentation about this as well, um, and we do have some FHWA staff on the phone that can answer questions if the need arises as well. Um, another question for you, Kyle. What is the purpose of a raised crosswalk? Is it to increase vertical visibility of pedestrians to drivers? Uh, the raised feature providing physical notice to a driver seems ineffective since the notice will be felt by the driver at the point of conflict with the pedestrian. 
I think it's a little bit of both. Um, primarily, it's a little bit more of a of a visual cue to the motorist that they are approaching a crosswalk, kind of similar to an aesthetic treatment that might be used uh, within crosswalk markings. There is certainly an element, a physical element to it as well. Um, as they're approaching the raised crosswalk, the, the intention is for the motorist to uh, essentially be somewhat required to slow the vehicle speed down. But you do raise a good point in that the actual physical obstruction is at the crosswalk, and by the time they actually reach it, it's essentially already at the crosswalk itself. Um, Jan, I know you had looked at the raised crosswalk and had included that as a geometric element. Do you have anything else you want to uh, include as far in regards to the uh, raised crosswalks? Well, the, we include the raised crosswalk in this um, uh, treatment uh, because we uh, have some local people on this uh, project panel. Um, as you all know, as the state route, we don't really allow any like a uh, raised crosswalk because the raised crosswalk is essentially a speed bump. Uh, it's, a, it's a speed coming measure. And the main purpose to that is to reduce the speed. And also, the raised crosswalk itself uh, seldomly used by individually on, on any point. Usually, it's an area-wide uh, improvement. For example, you can see this raised crosswalk uh, overall along this whole campus area, but seldom you can see it individually implemented. Um, but uh, as, as we all discussed, they have some like drawbacks too. Uh, but still, as um, pedestrian treatment, also as long as as a like a speed coming measures, it can it can improve the, um, like the visibility and reduce the limits. And of course, like as a result, as a result to improve tra uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, thank you, Yen. Um, Kyle, another question that we had um, for you is, are in-roadway warning lights susceptible to snow cloud damage? In our experience, yes. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why we've kind of shied away from using them in Illinois. Um, we've had a few <clears throat> installations of these in-roadway warning lights as well as embedded raised pavement markers. and. We are a state that is very aggressive in our snowplow operations. So as a result, we have had issues of snowplow damage with these individual markers. So that is also a consideration that agencies should look at if they're considering the in-roadway warning light treatment. Um, another question for you as well. Uh, if on-street parking is allowed, is that counted as a travel lane for your table? The on-street parking or shoulders are actually not included as a lane. And I believe the next example I go over will actually have a parking lane uh, example. So we can kind of discuss that with the next example. But to answer the question, no shoulders and parking lanes would not be included for purposes of that recommendation table. Um, another question for you. Do your recommendations consider CMFs for each of the strategies? Jan, you might want to provide input on this, but I, I don't know if we considered CMFs for the table. I believe it was based on the actual field research you had conducted for Illinois-specific crosswalks, as well as your um, reviews and your interviews. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, we we didn't really consider that. That's based on our like in-state uh, question analysis and and our field review. That's right. Um, the next question 
is from Oregon DOT, and they'd like to know what you recommend if neither a traffic signal, a PHB, or a speed limit reduction are warranted. If the pedestrian hybrid beacon or signals, if neither of those are warranted, um, then I think you're potentially looking at a grade separated crossing or a pedestrian bridge. Again, as I mentioned before, that's certainly not the most cost effective countermeasure, but based on the recommendations of this research, we really want to try to avoid using an uncontrolled crosswalk when you're reaching speeds of 45 miles per hour or more. Um, another clarifying question we got, I believe this is a follow-up to, to the first question that was asked. Um, are you mentioning that a marked crossing is justified based on an average of one fatal or two serious injury crashes per year or based on a single incident? Jan, what would be your recommendation on that? Would you recommend basing that on the average of several years of previous crash data? Sorry, I always forgot to unmute. Um, I think this way we can like take a two ways. So if it's a if it's on like a just a severe injuries, we will look at uh, beyond like a three or preferably five years. But it's the fatality. I think it's when once there's a fatality, we will start uh, like initiate the uh, the study or engineer study to see if it's possible to get some um, treatment in, installed. Um, the next question is: A pedestrian refuge island a raised median for the purpose of the recommendation recommendation table? For purposes of the table, I would say a, a pedestrian refuge or raised island would be considered a raised median. Pretty much any type of refuge area for the pedestrian would be considered a raised median. And Jan, I don't know if you want to uh, provide any input on that as well. So the raised median and the refuge island as long as it's raised, it's all considered as a raised medium. So I agree with Kyle. But any other uh, medium, like a painted medium, are not considered as like a separation for the two uh, directions. Um, and again, our FHWA partners are um, mentioning in the chat pod to, to one more time, make sure that you are looking at MUTCD section 3B.18 on crosswalk markings for the exact language and criteria about marking crosswalks. So that should be your first reference um, for any of these questions that have come up in the chat pod so far. Um, we're going to do one more question, and then I'm going to move us over to the next section, and we can come back to these afterwards. But the Missoula um, MPO is asking if there is a danger of overmarking crosswalks. That is, do they lose effectiveness if every minor street has a crosswalk across the major street? I think that can certainly be the case, and that is one of the reasons why we had recommendations for having minimum distances between adjacent crosswalks. But we also want to consider any crosswalks that might be near signalized intersections or other controlled locations, particularly for urban areas. Um, if, if there are ways to essentially try to funnel pedestrians to certain specific crossing locations, that is certainly the best option. We want to try to reduce the number of crosswalks if possible and thus reduce the uh, amount of locations or areas where uh, pedestrians may be uh, where they're uh, susceptible to traffic or potential crashes. And Jan, I don't know if you, do you have any other input on that as well? Sorry. Uh, I agree with Kyle, and that's the reason we set the minimum distance, like 300 feet. Um, and in urban areas, 200 feet. 
for the alternative uh, crossing. But still, um, we have some issues when there's a corridor, and we have uh, you may have a like, crosswalk um, every like uh, over 300, maybe 350 feet away along the corridor. So for that case, our suggestion will be. Uh, to have the marked crosswalk, but uh, may reduce the number of signs on the road side to not confuse like the, the motorist. So that's the thing I want to make. I want to mention. Um, Kyle, at this point, I am going to ask you to go ahead and start the next section. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left in today's presentation. I'd like to make sure that we get get through all of it. Um, we will take questions again later. Okay. Uh, this next se section includes three specific examples of existing crosswalks where we already have some countermeasures in place and we're utilizing the recommendations table to determine if any additional countermeasures should be used. So this particular example is what I was mentioning earlier about the parking lane and the shoulder. So this particular example in Peoria, we already have the marked crosswalk, and that's the only treatment that we have in place. This particular location has an ADT of 3,900 vehicles per day, a speed of 30 miles per hour, and for purposes of the table, we consider this to be a typical two-lane highway. So we do not include the parking lane or shoulder as far as the lanes go. So when we look at the table, we are in the section where the ADT is less than 9,000. We are in the column with the 30 mile per hour speed. And we are using the row that says two lanes or three lanes with a raised median. And you'll see that the recommendation is basic treatment. So we already have the marked crosswalk at this location. We definitely should be including the uh, standard pedestrian warning sign assemblies as well. I would also point out that this is another location where we could consider a bulb out or a curb extension for this area where the crosswalk actually crosses the parking lane. By doing so, we're reducing the length of the crosswalk and reducing pedestrian exposure to motorists. But also by having the bulb out, you're also creating somewhat of a physical barrier to help ensure that motorists are not parking in that parking lane too close to the crosswalk itself and thus reducing the sight distance of any pedestrians that are utilizing that crosswalk. The next example is within a small village uh, in Illinois. Uh, even though it's within a village, it's a very small village, so it's essentially a rural location. It's a somewhat higher speed uh, state highway uh, at 40 miles per hour. We currently have a marked crosswalk at this location, and we also have an existing sign assembly that's using a flashing LED around the border of the sign. So if we look at the recommendation table, we see the ADT is around 1,250, the speed is 40 miles per hour, and it's an undivided two-lane highway. So if we look at the table, we look at the recommendations, and the ADT is less than 9,000, it's a 40 mile per hour speed, two-lane highway, the recommendation is for a flashing beacon or a flashing sign plus advanced stop line with sign. So we already have the marked crosswalk. We already have the flashing sign. But based on the table, we would actually recommend also including the advanced stop line with the associated sign in advance of the crosswalk. And then the final example is in Auburn, Illinois. And this particular location, you can see we don't have a marked crosswalk. To the left of the highway is the high school football field and track field. The high school itself is actually two blocks to the right of this particular intersection. And the open field that you see to the right is actually utilized for parking for the high school football games. Currently, right now, it's kind of a bit of a free-for-all as far as pedestrians. They have local police go out 
and actually direct traffic and allow pedestrians to cross the roadway. So there is definitely a pedestrian need, or at least a need for a crosswalk in this particular area. So if we look at the particular characteristics of this location and the recommendation table, based on an ADT of 6,250, a speed limit of 40, and the presence of two lanes, the table again recommends flashing beacons or a flashing sign along with the advanced stop line and associated sign. Now, before we would actually implement that, we would really need to have coordination with the high school and with the community to establish what the des or where the designated walking path should be. Where exactly should the crosswalk be located and where is the path? I mean, should we include sidewalks? Where exactly should the sidewalk be? We really need to answer those basic questions first before we start implementing an actual crosswalk and the additional countermeasures that would go along with establishing that particular crosswalk. Okay, and Jamie, that would end that section. Perfect, thank you, Kyle. Um, I am gonna go through probably two more questions with you and then we'll move on to Yan's section and, and finish up the questions afterwards. Um, but the first one is, do you consider bus stops when selecting treatment? Bus stops are actually going to be discussed in the next section, I believe, and Jan's gonna discuss how you should orient the crosswalk in relation to the actual bus stop itself. As far as a bus stop being a countermeasure, I, I don't think we actually considered that. It was more a case of where exactly should you place the crosswalk if it's near a designated bus stop. Um, the next question is, did this research look at the yielding rates of each of these options, and how effective is one treatment over another? Was this addressed? Jan, I'll let you respond to that because that kind of ties into some of the field reviews that you actually conducted for some existing crosswalks in Illinois. Uh, yes. Uh, so for the yielding rate, uh, because we, uh, for this research, we uh, examined uh, a, a different a variety of the treatment. Uh, what we did that we reviewed extensively all the past studies regarding each treatment. And we have uh, summarized all this yielding rate from past studies to see, okay, which treatment have a higher yielding rate in which situation. So based on that, we decide, okay, this treatment will be more effective at what uh, speed level or len len number of lens and uh, also traffic volume. So that's the way we develop this table. So we, we did look at this yielding rate and they, um, they all, like, uh, we consider that with, when we develop this um, uh, selection table. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna have you go ahead and move forward with the next section, Mia, just to make sure we, we make it through all of your slides. Okay, good, good, thanks, Jamie. So this the last session will be uh, some non-treatment factors uh, that affect pedestrian safety at uncontrolled location. Um, as um, Kyle and my audience just mentioned, will will we consider bus stop during this procedure? Yes, but a bus stop is not uh, a treatment, but we do consider uh, the bus stop's impact on this pedestrian safety. So it's all included in this section. So first, I want to uh, touch base on touch about this uh, topic of the crosswalk pattern. Um, in last two sessions, Carl uh, talked about the treatment of marked crosswalk. So what exactly the pattern of the marked crosswalk we recommend? So we have a, a variety of the uh, crosswalk patterns. So this slide shows several of them. Um, uh, I apologize. This this uh, figure is not very uh, clear, it's kind of fuzzy, but still, I, I think you can still see uh, each one, solid, standard, continental, dashed, zebra, and ledger. Um, based on this study, we recommend all high visibility crosswalk. 
uh, pattern. So these higher visibility ones include continental, zebra, and ladder. But uh, consider the cost and the maintenance fee. Uh, we uh, recommend the continental one because this one is high visibility, vis high visible pattern, but uh, with less like um, with without the, the two parallel lines and will um, require less maintenance. So that's the crosswalk pattern. Also, I want to mention uh, another type of uh, high visibility crosswalk will be the texture one, like the capstone or brick crosswalk. That's also OK. Uh, but uh, when these crosswalk are used, we suggest to come with the standard crosswalk too. We have the two parallel uh, solid white line um, with this, uh, used with this uh, texture crosswalk. Because the texture crosswalk alone is, is hardly visible during uh, dark condition at night. So adding this uh, standard crosswalk crosswalk <laughs> will increase their visibility uh, during night, increase the safety. <clears throat> So that's the crosswalk pattern issue. Uh, next is the bus stop uh, issue. So uh, the bus stop location um, really um, impact the pedestrian safety. We have uh, several fatality and severe crashes occurred when the pedestrian tried to cross the street behind, uh, before, in front of the, the bus. Uh, that way. Uh, the upcoming um, vehicle couldn't see the pedestrian crossing and the pedestrian couldn't see the upcoming motorist. So that's how this crash uh, occurred. So to really avoid this uh, situation, it's really recommend to have the bus stop location on this far side of the crosswalk as this um, uh, picture shows. So the bus stop will be on the downstream of the crosswalk. And this way, the pedestrian get off the bus, and they will cross the crosswalk it's behind the bus. That will give them the um, like broader view to see the upcoming vehicles on both sides. So that's much, much safer. That's the uh, bus stop location consideration. Another factor um, is the crosswalk lighting. I mentioned in the first session that um, quite a few uh, severity and fatality occurred uh, during dark conditions. So that's why we recommend to, to provide lighting for uncontrolled crosswalk. So this um, figure provides a layout of this uh, lighting unit for the middle block location. So here, uh, this layout, uh, this one, just want to make two points here. First, uh, the lighting unit, uh, we recommend to use over light, overhead lighting unit instead of the, uh, just the headlamp, because the overhead lighting provide greater visibility distance. Uh, so that's the uh, first one, uh, point one. The second point will be um, for this layout, uh, we suggest uh, it to put the light unit uh, on the upstream of the crosswalk instead of on top on top of the crosswalk to provide enough um, vertical luminous flux. Uh, but we didn't uh, give a specific uh, distance to how far upstream those light units will be because there are a variety of factors that will affect that. Uh, for example, how high the pole is, and what time uh, lumini, and uh, how powerful it is, and uh, how much uh, luxury you want to achieve. So, so we didn't have a specific number, like uh, how much distance there will be, but uh, the whole idea will be this light unit should be installed um, some distance upstream of the crosswalk to achieve the adequate visibility, uh, the flex, a flex for the visibility, and exactly how to design the role, uh, design the, the light unit should be follow some uh, lighting design program within your agency. Uh, 
the next one, uh, it's, it's a use of the retroflective signpost and the dual back-to-back -back display. That is the good practice we observed during our field review. Uh, so there's two pictures. The one on the left shows um, dual back-to-back -back display of the pedestrian crossing sign uh, we observed in Chicago. So we have uh, usually uh, the sign will be posted only like one one side. So here it's kind of dual side back to back. So it's it, it high increased the, like a high visibility of this uh, the crosswalk sign. So the picture on the right shows uh, a high a highlighted uh, retroflect, reflective uh, post uh, uh, side post along the Illinois Road 29. Uh, they have the regular um, like a bicycle sign, but the post they have uh, attached, they have the retroflective sheet attached to the post on both sides. So uh, also it increased the visibility of the of this sign. Also result in uh, improved safety. So that's the uh, uh, two best practices we uh, observed during the field review. The final one I want to mention will be some education program. Uh, Kyle just mentioned uh, a lot of treatment. Some of them are commonly used, but some of them are not. Uh, a good example will be the uh, pedestrian hybrid beacon. Uh, past studies have shown that um, quite uh, like a large certain of uh, percentage of the motorists do not really well understand what's the flash yellow and static yellow or alternative flashing red. So I think it is necessary for the agency to uh, take some effort to uh, help the motorist to understand, to well understand those uh, treatments and uh, make it really effective. Uh, I believe that's the end of this session and we do have a poll question. Jimmy? Uh, it is, but because we are running tight on time, I am going to finish up with a few additional slides, um, and we'll we'll stay online for uh, five or ten minutes more for anyone who's able to stay with us and answer a few of the questions in the chat pod. So I do want to let everyone know that the um, the report that has been discussed today is available at this link. Um, again, this link can be found in the handout, available in the handout section as well. Um, we also have addressed as well that the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, um, this FHWA MUTCD team has terminated the interim approval 11 for these um, RRFBs. More information can be found at the link provided here. Um, and I do want to ask Becky Crow at this point as well to unmute her phone line and go ahead and address these next two slides. Um, she has some announcements for everybody as well. So Becky? Hey, Jamie. Thank you. Well, great presentations by Kyle and Jan. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, since you're interested in pedestrian safety, Federal Highway has a program called STEP, Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian, under our Everyday Counts for initiative. And we're promoting these five uh, countermeasures that you see on the screen. And we're also offering free technical assistance to anyone that is interested. Uh, in addition to that, we're having a webinar. And I'm going to post it really quick in the chat pod um, on January 30th. And we'll be uh, discussing our new guide for improving pedestrian safety at uncontrolled crossing locations. Uh, and it's a, a six, it's a six step process for selecting countermeasures, and we hope that you can join us. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, I did want to see, Bruce, are you on the line and available to unmute your phone line real quick? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Um, we did have okay. two questions uh, in the chat pod about the RRFBs that I'd like to ask you. Um, the first was, why was it terminated? And the second was, um, could it still be installed if non-federal funding is used? So if you could answer those two, we'd appreciate it. OK. Well, the second question is the easier one. Uh, the answer to that is no. The interim approval 11, which allowed for the RFBs to be used on public streets and highways in the United States, 
uh, was terminated, meaning that they can't be used on any of the public streets and highways, at least not new ones uh, put in. The existing ones, we did not want anybody who had made an investment in putting in an RFP to have to take it out or convert it. So the existing ones that were put in by the 188 agencies that had our permission to install RFPs can remain until the end of their useful service life. But the installation of new or replacement RFPs is not related to whether it's federally funded or not. The reason that we had to terminate the RFP uh, interim approval had nothing to do with safety or effectiveness. In fact, it's not an action that we wanted to take, but it was an action that, that we had to do because of federal regulations. The MUTCD itself, paragraph four of the introduction, says that all the traffic control devices in the manual have to be in the public domain and cannot be protected by patents, trademarks, or copyrights. And unfortunately, a private company patented the RFP and wanted to be the sole source for uh, supplying these or have competitors licensed through the patent holder. And this is not acceptable to the federal government uh, based on federal regulations. Our chief counsel's office informed us that we would have to terminate the IA, the interim approval, because the federal government cannot put itself in a position of favoring one manufacturer over all the others, and essentially creating a monopoly on a particular device, even if it's an optionally used device. Nor could we in a, be in a position by specifying uh, the size, design, color, shape, flash pattern, et cetera, that matches the patent, that uh, we, we could not be in a position where we were enticing competitors to infringe on a patent. So we were told that it, it was necessary to terminate the interim approval, and that's what we did. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate you taking the time to join us on our webinar, Bruce, and answer questions for us. Again, for anyone who has additional questions, you can contact the Safety Center, and we will get you in touch with Bruce if you have additional questions on um, the termination of the, um, the interim approval. Um, I, at this point, I do want to thank um, Becky as well for providing us with information and the offer for technical assistance for the STEP program and for her webinar coming up on January 30th. Um, and I do want to thank Kyle and Yan uh, for taking the time to present today. I will ask them a few of these last remaining questions, but for anyone who has to um, disconnect from the webinar, we do appreciate you taking the time today to join us. And we will be having a presentation in February on the primer um, that looks at the Highway Safety Manual and the Human Factors Guide um, for Roadway Systems. So um, Kyle and Yen, um, the next question we have for you is, are your findings based on posted speed limit or prevailing speed? Um, do you use the higher of the two? And what measure was used in developing the table? Uh, this is Yen. I, I would like to answer the question. So uh, for the speed limit we use is the post speed limit. And we have talked about that, discussed that internally. So what type of speed we will use to confine that? Um, for, for other speed, we have like operating speed. Um, the reason we use the speed limit is because this is a, can be like a fixed, like a consistent. If you use other speed, like uh, uh, operating speed, uh, it's, not, it's based on like uh, the time you're measured than. It's really not really, uh, I mean, consistent. Uh, over time or along the road. So we decide to just use the post speed limit. That will be easier uh, to, to implement this treatment. Thank you. Um, and it does look like this next question, I'm actually going to have you not answer, but I will um, read it out loud. It says, is the advanced stop or yield lines and signs MUTCD compliant on a two-lane highway? Um, FHWA has told us it is not. So um, at, at that point, I would believe that we, we should go with what the MUTCD and FHWA um, have told you um, about that. We can get more clarification from FHWA if you would like for that answer. So if you would just send us an email at info at ruralsafetycenter.org, um, I can pass that question along to our FHWA um, staff members. 
So um, another question is, is the solid and dashed still acceptable per MUTCD? Yeah, I, I guess, is, I guess, oh, okay, go ahead. My question would be what exactly is being referred to? Is it, is it the actual crosswalk pavement markings? Uh, I mean, they ask uh, if the uh, solid or dashed crosswalk uh, still allowed in MTCD. Uh, I, it's, it's off my head. I believe, I believe the solid one, uh, I need to check the MTCD. Uh -huh. Yana, yeah, that's I, fine. Um, so I'd rather hear me. I can answer guys... that one. Oh, okay. sure. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Bruce Friedman, the MUTCD team. Um, actually, the, the solid crosswalk marking, where it was just simply a very large white area across the pavement and the dash lines only, uh, I don't know that they were ever compliant with the manual. They certainly haven't been in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, it, crosswalk lines need to be used that are solid lines. They can be the the two transverse lines. They can have the uh, continental striping in them or the diagonal striping in them. And if you use that, you can even eliminate the transverse lines. But um, no, I, the dash lines and the uh, solid crosswalk are not allowed. OK. Thank you. And, and we do, again, appreciate you being on the line to, to help us with some of these answers. Um, we do have in the chat pod as well that section 3B.16 of the MUTCD is where the advanced stop and yield lines are covered for those of you who are looking for that answer as well. Um, so at this point, I am going to have to wrap up the, the webinar um, before it shuts down on us. And I do want to, again, thank Kyle and Yan for taking the time to, to present for us today. Remind you one more time about that January 30th webinar that FHWA will be having. Um, and thank Bruce and Becky for joining us as well. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you.